Good afternoon. Good afternoon if you're in the UK where it's four o'clock and good afternoon if you're in Europe where it's five o'clock. And of course, good morning to anybody joining us today on the east or indeed the west coast of America. Looking forward to sharing with you this hour the story of how cult created content with impact. I'm Don Taylor, your host. I'll introduce myself in a minute. Uh, this topic of how you create content with impact is pretty crucial to the learning and development profession. We do create content as a core part of our job, making sure that it does its job. Well, that's pretty essential and it's not always something we focus on enough. Here, we're gonna look at some of the key challenges that Colt, a telecommunications company based in the UK faced and how it went on to deal with two very different challenges through a very explicit content solution that enabled the production of content to have an impact. All right, that's enough from me. Let's, let's introduce myself and then, of course, the person who actually counts here, our main speaker today, which is Pin Patel. So I'm Donald Taylor. I'm the chairman of the Learning and Performance Institute and the Learning Technologies Conference in London. And I've been in this field for an awfully long time, over 30 years, and I'm delighted to say things are getting better. We're seeing a lot more smart use of technology, in particular in this field of content creation. Pin Patel, Learning Experience Consultant at Colt Technologies. Pin, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Don. Hi, everyone. Uh, as I said, I'm Pin Patel. Um, I'm working at Colt. Um, as a Learning Experience Consultant, um, my job here is to project manage um, learning, uh, digital learning projects uh, across the business. Um, my background is L&D uh, for a number of years and a bit like Don, I've seen <laughs> L&D change quite a lot. Um, interestingly, doing this webinar, it made me think about the first e-learning module I did and it's a complete world away from what we're doing now and, and, and what we're gonna do in the future. It's, uh, yeah, exciting times. I like that. I like that point about the difference. It is, isn't it? And because things change week to week, month to month, we don't necessarily yeah. notice it. But you look back and you think, yeah, we've come a long way. Pin, can you tell us, can you tell us something about Colt Technologies? Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're a, a global telecoms company. Uh, telecommunications, we do, uh, well, basically, we, we're the guy that connects our customers uh, together to everybody else. Um, we're based around the world. Um, uh, that's probably bad, about it for now. Um, well, tell me how many employees you've got. That oh, gives people an uh, idea. Uh, over 5,000 right. situated uh, across the world. Okay. So we've got a, big, a lot of people situated around the world and, of course, trying to maintain um, a common experience for the customer and also uh, right procedures internally with those yeah. people. Also on the line, uh, well, not on the line, but on the, on the webinar, we've got Ryan McBride. Ryan's the head of content at Views, uh, worked very closely with PIN during this project. Uh, Brian, of course, very bashful character, and he's gonna only be accessible uh, during the chat. Actually, of course, he's, he's full of life and very bubbly, but he just doesn't want to crowd us out. He's gonna let us do the talking. I say that, let us do the talking, but actually what I really would like to do is to ask everyone on the call a question. How do you, when you're involved in learning and development yourself, uh, look, there's Ryan in the chat area, and if you're not sure where the chat is, by the way, uh, it, this is an integral part of the, of the experience. You can on your keyboard, if you've got a, uh, a PC, hold down the Alt key and just press H, it'll pop up, or just go to the menu and choose chat. I'd love you to answer this question in the chat area, if you can. Thinking about your L&D experience and, and what you do, how do you make sure that your content has impact when you're creating content for your organization or indeed if you do it for other people how do you make sure it has impact and you're welcome to say well we don't we, we do we have other criteria for success any thoughts about that please put it in the uh, webinar chat and please make sure in the drop down you choose for all panelists and attendees so everyone can see it that'd be great and in the meantime what i'm just going to ask pin a question about this um, if, if anybody's got any answers to this question, please drop them in. I'm going to just ask Pin a question. Pin, for you, without thinking about the actual challenges you faced, what does impact mean? Impact for me means that people actually not just engage with the learning and not just apply it, but actually impact means that what do they do to the wider community? How do they engage with their colleagues and spread the word? 
that to me is impact right um, you know we, we we kind of stop at the user but for me it's beyond that user and what do they do it with their colleagues and how do they then take it a step further uh, to me that's impact and, and make a real business change so it's a combination of that individual behavior change and this business of spreading it amongst their colleagues as well absolutely all right well look Pin, let's go forward and look at the challenges that you were facing when you, well, at Colt, you, you were facing two challenges, very big picture, sales certification and customer communication. This is two, this is two very different challenges, uh, one on the uh, internal side, one on the external side. Just before we go to that, um, I just want to give a shout out to Katy, Katy or Katie, sorry if I haven't pronounced your name correctly, uh, is saying uh, um, that for, for, for Katie, making sure your content has impact, it's all about at the point of need and relevant to make change. So in other words, and I, I think this is, a, this is something we'll come up against, I think many times in the presentation, this idea of the point of need. Uh, you'll be familiar, of course, with both Bob Mosier and Conrad Gottfriedson's five moments of learning need, the idea that there are, there are five points where you might have a moment of need, and those are very different. Sometimes you want to learn something new. Sometimes you want to remember something you learned earlier. Sometimes you just need to tweak something. Uh, at the moment of need, fine. You find the right content for that need. And also, Katie says, very importantly, it has to be relevant to make the change. So you, the impact comes from a change of behavior. That's Katie's point. And I think that's something, thank you for that. I think that's something we'll come back to during the course of the presentation. Pin, sales certification, that's internal. Customer satisfaction or communication, clearly that's external. Yeah. Two very different challenges. Tell me about it very quickly, top level. Well, I suppose um, for the, the both change, changes that face both of those is actually engaging our, our audience internally on the actual learning itself. Um, if we take sales certification, you know, busy people, um, needed uh, to get to in the moment training they want stuff now uh, customer communication that was more about a global audience with very different cultures very different thoughts on what is great customer communication and how do we then get that into a, a cohesive learning plan and strategy so yeah the sales certification was you know a, a very time sensitive and the other was actually more cultural sensitive that's really interesting so on the left hand side time sensitive these people sales guys they're driven by their numbers yeah. they want to do as little as possible to get out there and start hitting yeah. their targets on the right hand side yeah cultural communication we've, we've established cults a global organization and your customers are all over the world communication effective communication is going to be something different to those people in different parts of the world all right uh pin take us through it oh sorry let me just let, go back back there Whoa. Let, let, let's, let's start with self-certification how about that let's do that so if we if we look at the, the, the these are the three challenges and, and the, there are a number of other ones obviously but the, these are the three key that we kind of identify as these people being engaged and you touched on it just there Don as well in saying that these are salespeople I've got a sales background <laughs> uh, and, you know I, I I I get it there are pressures on these people to do deals uh, that's what they're there for but their KPIs etc um, and trying to get them away from that and engage with learning was huge because most of their learning has been done up until now either online mandatory you know they're applying stuff which you have to do which you know, every company has or, or it's been very classroom based uh where you go to and that but we wanted people to take more ownership of their learning and do it in the moment when they need it um, so yeah that was a that was a bit of a a, a new one and, and and sales hadn't really we haven't done this before with these guys um now, Pitt, can i ask then if you if, if and i totally get where you're coming from these people are focused on you know making their sales do they regard learning something today as a valuable activity to doing better sales tomorrow at the time I would question that whether they did or, or, or not, because inherently sales people would tend to say, well, I learn by doing and I, and I just get on with it. And, you know, we, we learn on the job and whatever. <laughs> um, you know, what's this bit of software that's going to change me and help me? Um, you know, I'm doing OK. Um, so that 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 was it. Getting them engaged in that was was huge. But I think now it is actually 
yeah, I think this can help me. Um, and yeah. Okay, so you've, you've actually made a cultural change within your sales team. They see the benefit. Yeah, absolutely. All right, absolutely. so number one. Still, but yeah, we're, we're getting there. Well, I'll no, be honest. Uh, yeah, but cult, cultural change is never quick. So if yeah. you're if you're able to shift some of the people, then that yeah. creates its own momentum, and others come along the way with you. Brilliant. All right. Mm -hmm. So you, you want them engaged with their learning, and, and and you're getting there. And I guess during the course of the yeah. webinar, we're going to see how you created the content and engaged yeah. with people in order to make that happen. Absolutely. But what does time to productivity mean? For well, you? time to productivity is is a key measure for us. And, and yeah. how this came about was we're a tech company and. We, when we recruit, it was driven by our recruitment strategy. We originally fished from the same pond, i.e. the same telco salespeople. They do the rounds and they move from company to company and occasionally you get new talent. And hmm. one of the things that we decided to do is actually look beyond that, that pool of talent uh, and actually embrace maybe salespeople from different backgrounds. But that poses quite a big challenge to go, well, look, how do we get these guys up to speed? If you're getting somebody from a telco background, they, they, they tend to be familiar with the products. They tend to be familiar with the jargon and the processes, et cetera. But if you get somebody from, say, I don't know, innocent drinks, and they know nothing about telco uh, and all the bits that surround it. And our sales are complex. So time to productivity is quite an interesting one. Uh, Actually, Pin, I mean, you know, can we just, I'm sorry to pull you off track now for a second. You said your sales are complex. I'm assuming that if somebody sells a deal with Colt, you're talking about digging up streets and putting cables Absolutely, down. Absolutely, yeah. This isn't a sort of, you know, you, you're not buying a laptop where you just kind of take it away and away you go. It's These are big multi-million pound deal some of them you know and we are yeah digging up pavement sometimes for these customers so it is complex uh, and we've got to get it right and actually the impact of getting it wrong um is huge imagine if your communication your internet was cut off or you couldn't use your phones uh, you know anybody who's on the line now suddenly you can't use your phone what what would happen to your business it would it, it, it cripples doesn't it so yeah you know this stuff's got to be right and uh, so it, it is complex uh, and highly impactful um to the, to the customer so we, we need to make sure that the guys that we are we are getting into our business understand the industry very very quickly understand our products the processes and what it takes so time to productivity is a measure that we are looking at to go how quickly can we get these guys up to speed and what do they then need to do in order to get up to speed um so that's again a huge challenge uh, one again we haven't been faced before because we've never really hired outside a normal a talent pool. Itself. Now, I appreciate it might be commercially sensitive, but are you able to share with us where you are and where you want to get to with that? Presumably, it's several several months to get productive, and you'd like it to be yeah, slightly absolutely. fewer months. I, I can't share the exact numbers. I think that that is you're right. It is a bit sensitive, <laughs> but but we are talking sort of months in terms of you know these deals don't just happen in a week or whatever. There's a lot of planning that goes involved, so you can take up to six months. We we we, we want to get that down as short as possible. Um, but also get it right. Um, so that's, yeah. I'll leave so, it at that. <laughs> I'll show you numbers. Uh, yeah, I, think it's, I think it's a situation a lot of people in the audience will understand and absolutely sympathise with. Yeah. Whether it's salespeople or anybody else, you hire somebody, the time before they're doing their job is dead time as far as the business yeah. is concerned. You want to get absolutely. them through that as quickly as possible. Yeah, so what's the certification? Is this an external certification, internal? What does it mean? Internal certification. Um, we wanted to... to have a look at how do we get our, our people. A, a, it's part of the engagement process. You know, there, you, you, there's not just knowledge out of it. We want to finish, but actually, the incentive for this is we'll link it to our career paths. So there are certain um, levels that you'll need to be certified on, and certain things that we do. So product uh, knowledge, your processes, our internal processes that we use, our systems, and um, our sales skills. Because we know that if you if we hit those four. Your time to productivity improves, your deal value improves, your customer's experience improves. So we wanted to certify that actually, in order to expose you to maybe bigger accounts, uh, bigger deal sizes, promotions, we needed some sort of validation that you know, you know what you're doing. Um, you know, and, and, and that was what the certification was really about. Is, and, and it gives somebody that almost rubber stamp to say, yeah, I've done it. Yeah, I, I can do this, uh, and here's my evidence. So, and it's a form of validation. Is there a sense of pride for people who've passed the certification? Absolutely, 
absolutely 100 percent. you know there is that there and, and there has to be um because yeah I, i've got it uh oh, well i want to get it as well so if you if you and, and that's the momentum we want to get um and as i said look we're on this journey with fuse to, to make this happen um are we there yet no but we're getting there we've launched mm -hmm. phase one but the, the next few phases will be uh, just as exciting ben don't worry about it i mean i'm putting together the learning technologies conference for next year it's my 20th learning technologies conference yeah. uh, every case study i talk to it is always a journey nobody's yeah. ever reached the end yeah. because you get to what you think is the end and guess what mm. you've just discovered all the stuff along the way that you need to be doing yeah that's our challenges with sales that was one of the yeah. challenges that you had uh, the sales mm. certification and, and just making sure you had a team that was engaged uh, with the learning and getting there faster and, and getting that rubber, not rubber stamp, getting the seal of approval at the end. Yeah. That's internal. But then mm. you've got your customers on the outside and the communication. Yeah. Them. You said that was a very different challenge. Absolutely. Very, very different. Because it, 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 it's, it's, because it was a global cultural thing that we, yeah. we, we wanted to change. And, and, and that can be quite difficult sometimes because there are, inherently in, in different cultures, different way, what expectations of what good, good looks like. Um, what was reassuring is that actually as a business, the way we communicate with our customers was actually really good. It wasn't, you know, we, obviously we, 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 like any business, we drop the ball sometimes, but actually we're really good. What we wasn't though is amazing, brilliant, exceptional, you know, and, mm. um, and, and, we were in pockets, like we had some moments of genius, but we didn't have that consistency. So the, the, the question there is, uh, is quite the, the most important question. How do we really engage with our customers? What is it that we really need to do? And we sort of identified four key areas that, you know, in order for us to, to be um, at, at, the, at the top of our game and be their competitors in terms of customer communication, the four key areas, speed, so, can we be the quickest of what we do? Um, because that's, again, we're in a tech industry, so mm. speed is obviously really important. Um, well, it's, it's not just your tech, but also, of course, as you said earlier, um, comms is mission critical. And absolutely. if you're not communicating, then it could it could be really frustrating for customers. 100%, so speed, how we deal with our customers, you know, whether they, not, not just when they're complaining, but just when they just have a, a, a simple question, and how quickly can we, we get the answer to the customer. But taking ownership, um, and that's a big thing for us at Colts now is owning the problem. We don't want to go down the route of that's not my department. That's the words that you'll never hear from us. And that we want right. to eradicate that. Not me, it's, it's someone else's team. You know what I mean? I'll pass you on. <laughs> no, no, no. We're going to deal with it. We're going to own it and make sure stuff happens. So, and again, we're really good at it, but we weren't consistent across our business with it. You know, moments of genius, but we didn't. Accuracy, again, being... And accuracy isn't just about sort of, you know, dotting the eyes across the T, but it's, it's being accurate with our customers in terms of how we address them, how we engage with them, how, what do we say to them. Um, we want to avoid rework. And again, when we did the analysis, we realized that actually quite a lot of our stuff was rework, which then caused delays, um, which didn't have to be if we just got it right first time rounds and, and, and the impact of that on our customers. So again, being accurate both internally and externally was crucial. And also, and this is a tricky one because style, um, it's hard to define sometimes, but you know, our tone of voice with our customer, you know, how do we address them? Because culturally across different businesses, uh, different sort of, uh, locations, um, you know, culturally sometimes it's very formal. You know, they like the dear mister, whereas cult, we wanted to get slightly more informal and be a bit more customer centric by saying, hello. Um, so it, it's getting these messages across was that was, was the number one challenge. So we have a consistent approach. Uh, look, and I have to say, I'm fascinated by this. I'm just going to recap for everybody. Mm. Tell me if I'm wrong. Speed, ownership, accuracy, and style or tone, yeah? Mm. Um, just very, I, I realize this is slightly off topic, but how did you identify that those were the four common factors for, if you like, communications excellence with your customers? Really simple. We asked our customers. <laughs> it's as simple as that. If you, if you want to engage with your customers, right. ask them. Awesome. You know, what do we do well? What don't we do well? What do you want to see? 
us do better. Uh, and they came up with that. And that's that's as simple as that. We, we, you can't go wrong then. If you ask customers, you can't go wrong. No, no it's an absolutely fair point. Personally, uh, I, I have, I won't say the name of it, it's not Colt, I'm sorry to say, a, a telecommunications provider at uh, my home office uh, that used to have a very chatty um, menu system on their voice mm. and on telephone support. And it drove me mad. I, I don't want somebody to pretend they're flirting with me on the phone. I just want to get through to, to support. Uh, in the end, they changed it. I don't think I was the only one who, who didn't like it. But you know what they should have done? They should have asked the customers first. So I love that. Um, the accuracy piece is not just about communication, though, is it? It's also about get it right first time. That means you're spending far less money on, as you say, the rework. So you've got these, you've got these four things, speed, ownership, accuracy, and style. What's the multiple delivery streams and how does well, that affect things? Well, the multiple delivery stream came from the fact that there was a, a, a lot of internal communication about this. Uh, you, know, it was a, um, you know, we e introduced the, the standards and communicated them out. But we need to do more than that. Um, because when we looked at it, the actual standards themselves, when, if you read them, if I'm honest, you said, well, this is just basic stuff. You know, but we need to get the message out simultaneously to multiple locations and do the launch um so just so, to be clear just to be clear the multi multiple delivery streams refers to the delivery of the learning to your customer reps and okay. the messages that we want to get out okay. so we, we we used you know obviously the, the online piece is what we're going to talk about but we wanted that element that you if these are soft skills given that our audience they do want some sort of face-to-face -face training. They wanted that. Um, you know, we ask our, our, our internal colleagues, you know, if we were to train this, what do you want? They said, well, look, we, we'd like to be able to discuss this, uh, mm. practice it, etc." cetera. Um, and so we want to do some face-to-face -face training. Now, unless you've got an army of trainers, we can never get everybody trained in a, a short time. In fact, when we did the, 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 the maths, yeah, we wouldn't get everybody trained uh, until yeah, the end of 2020 uh, at the earliest, which, which <laughs> now, by then I think things would have moved on a little bit and, you know, so the standards would have changed. So we, we, we kind of thought, well, we need an online solution so we can get things to it. But also we wanted something there is the multiple streams that people can go back to. People can go back and it's, you know, this is not a flash in the pan. Do you, know, do you remember six months ago we had this sort of training on customer comms? We wanted people to engage with the actual content and go back and refresh their memory and, uh, and, and yeah, and, and use it. Um, so, yeah, so we had, we had to combine the two as, as long, and, and along with some desk coaching. So, yeah, so there was multiple channels and we just need to make sure that which is the one that's going to impact as many people as we can in a short space of time. Sorry, very quickly, when you say desk top coaching, what, what is that? So we encourage our, our, our managers, team leaders, because it's great that you can do online learning and you do the classroom, but how do you, some, you, you ask, well, how do you make your training make impact? Well, impact is when it happens in the real world. So if you're a manager and you're sitting there and you can hear one of your colleagues on the phone, you know what the standards are, they know what the standards are, but they still need help in, in, in real time. And so they can coach them on the desk or listen back to a call or even look at their emails and just go through them and just see how we're doing with our standards and how we communicate with our customers so we can get real-time coaching. That's, you know, it's, it, it, it's nothing revolutionary. You know, this is not something, oh my God, groundbreaking. This was just something that was a really good practice to go online training, face-to-face, -face, and then we're going to help you put it in practice in the real world. I just wanted to get a, a, a clarification of what it meant for you and also i think what you're doing is you're reiterating the point here that it's not just one channel and that's really important yeah. all right i think I, and i'm going to ask everybody for their thoughts about this in a second and uh, the cross-cultural content piece yeah, it, yeah everyone wants this this affects the last of those four things isn't it style mm -hmm. slash tone it's going to be different in different parts of the world isn't it absolutely but we wanted to unify it so mm. we wanted the aim of this is that when when a customer calls cult, it doesn't matter who they speak to. They have that cult style, that tone. They know how they're going to be treated and communicated with. And that's difficult um, when you've got certain practices that, you know, that just, uh, just, just happened over time. And we wanted to change that. Um, and we needed a, a vehicle that can not just tell people what the new the, what we expect them to do but actually really engage with them and resonate with them um I, the other bit with this and, and and 
you know, I'll be totally honest with you. I think one of our feedback for our training up until sort of now was we were at headquarters in London and a lot of our training was very London centric or UK centric. It had a UK feel to it. Mm. And we were is actually so the people even though they would do it they still didn't engage with it because it didn't feel it didn't feel like a an india training it didn't feel like you know german or, or anywhere else in the world that we've got offices it just um it felt very uk-ish so again one of the briefs that we we, we wanted to, to give fuse was how do we make this multicultural how do we make it so it appeals to mass audience uh, and, and doesn't have a london feel but it has a cult feel all right. Well, that's a pretty tall order. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you, get, you go to Fuse and you're saying, right, okay, we've got, we got the shopping list, please. We want to be engaged. We want to get people up to speed fast. We've got the certification program. Plus, there's the whole customer communications thing we want to get sorted out. And it's got to work across different cultures yeah. with one tone. Can you sort that out, please? Uh, what did they do? <laughs> what did they do? Tell me. Tell me. They had, they had a, they had a, they had a four-step process, unless I'm wrong. Is that correct? Yeah. This is it. Yeah, they had a, a four-step process, um, and it's 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 centered around. First of all, it's it's find the experts. Now, I'll go a bit. I'm I'm not a tech expert. Um, I'm I'm not a necessarily a sales expert or a customer comms expert. But we have got them in the business. So let's go and speak to our somebody who who knows this stuff. Um, you know, um, but not just a technical expert, but actually who does this in the real world. Um, and that was quite important to resonate the training. So if we, if we think about sales um, and you look at some of the a process, process is quite boring for a lot of salespeople. But if you get a, a salesperson who's followed the process and shown you how it benefits, it makes it a lot more exciting and it makes more law, a lot more easier to apply um, because you kind of go, I can see that. So let's get an expert in and get their knowledge and tap into it. Um, and that was the first bit. Um, so technical as well as somebody on the ground who's, who, who's actually implemented this stuff. Um, we then got this captured digitally. Um, and I, when, when we looked at this, I just saw my experience of some e-learning was, let's take a camera on someone and get them to talk for two minutes, uh, which is pretty rubbish, really. Um, you have to be honest, uh, very boring. Um, but actually, what we wanted to capture is, you know, the, the word that, that spring to mind is, is, is it was to be really authentic about what they're talking about and having that passion uh, and not just being quite stiff in front of a green screen or whatever and, mm. and talk but this is you know let, let's ask them some questions and, and just capture that moment that mood and that, that little bit of oomph I, don't, I, I can't put it on there I can't I, I don't know how to describe it but that x factor thing that just says yes all right so but you've got you, you've got the capturing digitally but that is I mean, part of the value of this is that you, you, what you're doing, I guess, is you, you found the expert. An expert is non-scalable. Yeah. They, they, they cost for every hour you use them. Yeah. Capture it digitally and suddenly this becomes scalable. Their knowledge Absolutely. becomes something yeah. that you can distribute across those online channels. Uh, and well, I think we'll talk in a minute about how you actually go off and, yeah. and you, you, you make them exciting by, by filming them and, and what mm. have you and capture them digitally. Um, but what about active imagery? What, that, that could mean many things to many people. What, what does it actually mean? For me, it's, it's, the active imagery is actually highlighting sort of words and pictures on the screen to, that resonates with what that person's saying. Look, I'm, I'm a very visual person. If I was to watch a video that was just somebody's talking, I, it would pull the pants off me. I don't care how long it is. Mm. It's one minute, two minutes, I'll soon switch off. But actually, if we combine the auditory with the visual, and we all know this, if you're in L&D for uh, even just for a few months, you'll know that you, you, you've got to have two sides of it, you know. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to make sure that there was, you know, custom graphics on there that would that would accentuate the message so people could remember it and it makes it more memorable rather than just a person on the screen. Um, and actually the feedback has been that what people do remember is those words and those bits of text or that picture that comes on there that just highlights the message and rams it home. Uh, and that's so very interesting. So the active imagery refers to to adding images to what you're seeing, which it yeah. consolidates the learning that's taking place. Hundred percent. Like it. Okay. What's this fourth point? Courses, concepts. Uh, you know, when you when you're capturing a lot of, uh, when you're speaking to SMEs and experts on this, and people who are really passionate, about it, you get a lot of content, lots of it. So a lot of it is unexpected. Some gems that come out, but 
again, you know, we, I, th I think one of the films, uh, when we, we had a session that was meant to be for 20 minutes, in, I think it was an hour's worth of content. But what we wanted to do is actually chunk that down into real bite-sized pieces. So it actually means something and it has a flow. And that's what that is. It really is about sort of going, what are the key bits that we want to get out and how do we make this, you know, they'll say digestible for the user. Um, so they, 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 they come back, but they build as we go along rather than dumping it all in one go. So that was great. And I think there's something else in that phrase for me anyway, Pin, the idea of going from courses to concepts and process, mm -hmm. which is that, to procedures rather, what you're talking about is getting shifting the emphasis from a supply side to demand side the supply side mm -hmm. is i want to create a course i'm going to supply you with the course and you just have to put up with it but what the people want what they're demanding is concepts and procedures what does this mean that's the concept how do i do it that's the procedure so it's a real shift from l and d as being i don't know what i always call a pizza delivery service to actually really understanding the need of the business and supporting it so i love that fourth point there mm -hmm. Now, look, guys, uh, everyone listening, if you thought that four bullet points on a slide was busy, let us just blow your minds because we're going to step up one to Fuse's content strategy, which for me, I think is, and we're halfway through the presentation, is the, the point that this presentation hinges around because we're talking about how do we create content with impact. We've talked about the problems that you had. We talked about the, uh, this content solution approach which is to essentially capture SMEs expertise and then augment it digitally but then is that enough no there's a whole content strategy piece there's 12 things on this I'm just gonna put the slide up you might want to grab a screenshot of this you might want to share it if you want on LinkedIn or Twitter I think it's a great summary of 12 things that actually make learning content work. And I like those words at the top, what we know works. It's not been invented by somebody sitting in an armchair. This is stuff that Fuse, with their expertise and the years of actually doing this in the marketplace, have discovered really works. Ryan, uh, as I said earlier, he's not going to be here to, uh, to talk, but he is here to uh, supply this as an infographic. So if he'll make sure that everyone who's on the call gets this as an image later on by email, but capture now if you, if you wish to. We're not gonna go through all 12 points. That would be, that would be tedious. Let, let's choose three. Pin, uh, what three things, or four if you like, would you choose from this that, for you, made the most difference at Cult? Um, I'll go, look, for, for me, the massive difference, journalistic approach. This, so, sorry, this does sound, does sound a bit like a, a quiz show, doesn't it? Pin, yeah, yeah, what are your okay. four numbers you're gonna choose? Okay, so the journalistic approach, number two. Now, we've just talked about this, filming people, and capturing their expertise, why was that so important? It, it, was, it was a different approach, one that I hadn't seen necessarily before. Um, the, the, the true bit of it was rather than having asking our SMEs to script something, what we end up doing was working with Ryan and, and the SME, sitting down with them and working out what are the key points to, that we want our audience to, to understand. Um, and then what we end up doing is between me and Ryan is write some questions. So when the SME is there, we're actually having a conversation around four or five questions that we will ask them that will then lead on to a more conversation, conversational type uh, interchange. Do you know what I mean? It's, hmm. it's not, it wasn't a case of, right, here's, here's two minutes, we're going to count it down and talk. It was a case of, let's ask some questions. And do you know what? The feedback from the SMEs was, it was, it was they felt quite nervous about being filmed, as, as most people do when you stick a camera in their face. But actually, the journalistic approach, we just asked some questions, having a conversation and capturing that content and letting it go wherever it needs to go. Um, but making sure you've got your key points in there was brilliant. Uh, very, very quickly, very quickly. How do you decide which questions to ask? You're, you're not an expert in this. No, but what we want to do is work with uh, Ryan, self. Um, we sent the questions to the SME beforehand so they knew what we were um, going to ask them and see if there's anything else that they want to add to it. Um, and, and it worked that way. I mean, they, they were quite general, broad questions. It wasn't pinpoint, tell me exactly this. Uh, because we wanted to make them feel very relaxed about it and, and right. so it, it, it's I think I think that was 
a great way of doing it. Um, so much so that SMEs are chomping at the bit to do some more videos because they actually love doing it. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. So the journalistic approach was key to your uh, success with this method of, of creating great content. What other ones would you choose? Um, I think content formats in tune with what people love. Um, you know, it's, I, I, I'd say number three was, was crucial for us because traditionally e-learning has been long scorn type courses. Um, and look, they have their place and some people love them, some people don't. Mm. But for mm. me, um, they're not particularly appealing. Um, I, they're not particularly bite-sized uh, and we wanted it to be in the format that people go, look, do you know what? This is great. I can, I don't have to, it's, it's all about it's in the moment. I think to, nowadays people just want to get to the information that they need rather than having to wade through or watch loads of uh, pointless stuff to get to it. And it wasn't just the videos, but it was like infographics that, they, that we, we got together. Uh, it was doing things like real calls was brilliant. You know, we want to listen to real calls whilst they're going through the learning. How does this equate in the world? What does good look like? Or what does bad look like? So doing it in the content, in the formats that, that, that really, yeah, tune into the, what, what their audience want. That was, that was pretty cool. I hadn't thought about that at all, but obviously you, you're capturing a lot of information from these people. They will want to consume it different ways depending on their circumstances, depending on what works for them. So yes, this is, um, of course, echoing the consumerization of content. Uh, we, consume in the way uh, at work in the way we expect to consume outside as consumers whether it's i don't know netflix or uh, listening to stuff on the on the radio podcast whatever we expect stuff to be in that format for us if we're not well it, it jars all right so what what else if anything would you choose from the list um i think i'm, I'm gonna give a shout out to fuse because number nine publishing your content in the correct way i think you know uh, I, I would say that was a learning experience for me uh, as part of that on this content strategy because you know, how to put together the learning plans in a way that actually works for an individual. Um, and I will give a shout out to the team at, at Fuse, Ryan and Martin, that who actually did got a really good job in getting the flow right um, and how it, the look and feel and what that journey that person was going to take when they started um, the learning plan. That was, a, a, that was pretty cool. What was, just if I can ask, what what is it about that that you hadn't considered that they were doing at Fuse that was so successful? I think for me, how I actually, it's almost when you take a big piece of content, how does it go from, how do you build uh, up to uh, a complete learning piece? Because we, we said it was bite size. Hmm. Uh, and I, I think from them, it's how, if we look at, they took a lot of time to understand our processes, um, uh, our systems and, and how we actually use everything uh, here and it, it was it was just the, the, the logical format for me was how they did it and and when we look at the feedback saying yeah that actually all made sense because it linked together in the right order um, and, and 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 then even just how when somebody logged onto the system uh, we use fuse as our platform mm. and they saw first and how they would click through things and what the, what would they see first um how they it, it was just the look and the feel of it as well and how they published it on that platform was something that would draw you in um and before you knew it you learned a lot more than you actually intended to learn if that kind of makes sense no it uh, makes sense completely so what you, i mean when it says here publishing your content in the right way what we're talking about here is it's 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 not enough to have the content you have to get it to people not. in the right format in the right way now, right with the right way, structure yeah. you're putting a lot of emphasis on the structure there yes Definitely get that right because you do a little bit of content. Go, that was really good. Ah, but there's a natural step to oh, what about this bit and this bit? And before you know it, they've, they've, they've done half an hour's worth of learning without even realizing it. Uh, <laughs> but that's what you want, you know. And they go away and go, wow, that's amazing, you know. And they don't feel bad about it. You know, they they want to do it, so it's cool. Yeah, I thought it was quite clever. Pin, I think that's a really good point because I think very often we concentrate very much on the formats. And that's important on the content, that's important. We don't concentrate enough on the structure and leading people uh, from one thing to another. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're actually quite tight on time here because I've been really enjoying chatting, but I just want to quickly ask a question to the audience as well as to, your, to, to you. Um, well, you'll answer it very shortly. Um, in every form of content that we get out there, 
there's always these two things you want to do. You want to inform people. You've got to give them the stuff they need to do their jobs. But as well as that, of course, you want to engage them. You can't just give them the phone directory. You've got to give them something that is I don't know, exciting, that is engaging, and that makes sense. Now, I'm suggesting there's a contradiction there. Maybe there isn't. But I'd like to ask the audience, if, if you'd like to put any thoughts in the chat area, when you're creating content, how do you balance the need to inform your learners and engage them as well? Maybe there's not a contradiction there, but if there is, how do you balance it and do you perhaps err on one side rather than the other? You go more for engaging, less for informing, or do you just say, no, we're going to give people the information they need and they can, they can make it up as they go? Because we're slightly tight on time, I'm going to just go straight forward and please do, by the way, in the chat area, respond with your thoughts. But I'm going to go straight to Pin and ask, how did you do it? And I know there was a sort of, there was a, what you call a three form approach for it, Pin. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So my, my, we, we, we call it yeah, the informative, that's given the facts and etc. and all, all the, the disabled. My, my tangent of fuse was, how do I make this come alive? We, we, right. we call it humanize it, but it's how do you make it come alive? Um, so you get all that information, which is brilliant. How do we humanize it? And, but then how do we make sure that they can go back to it and engage with it? Um, and, and maybe refresh themselves on it. Um, I think if we go to the next slides, I'll, I'll maybe expand a little bit more rather than go to it. But, but those All are right. the three information. Is, yeah. so that's the big picture. Let's look at each one. Then. Informative. What, we've got to give well, people the information for sure. Absolutely. And, and, and that coming varies, to guys, whether that's, you know, if you're doing a, a system thing, you can do screen captures. Um, you can get, the info, you know, people don't get excited about, processes or, or systems I, I, forgive me if anybody does but for most <laughs> of us we don't you know um and so you know getting that information um is great and, and, and for me that's the the what to do uh, or the what is it and and it, it, it is what it is you know uh, it's very black and white for a lot of uh, the stuff that we were trying to teach these people so we, lots of information there but it is what it is Pin, I was laughing because actually I find information quite exciting and I love learning it, but I guess that makes me quite an easy target. Most people, yeah. you're right, don't get excited by it. Well, so, yeah, they don't. They don't. Um, so, so, so what do we do? How, do? how do we make it more exciting for people? How do we, how do we how, do? Right. humanize it's, it? Yeah, this is it. This is, and this isn't just sticking a, a, uh, a face on a slide or, or, or having <laughs> somebody just, just, just there talking to camera. This is about really looking at how does this... I told you about we've got an SMEs that look at the technical part of it, but we also get somebody who's on the ground doing this every day. And it doesn't have to be a senior board. It could just be somebody quite junior or, 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 or whoever. It's not about the level. It's about having real case studies, you know, and getting them to cross say, look, this is what needs to do, but this is how it's benefited me. This is how I do it. This is why I do it. Um, so it, when you take a boring process, and you kind of look at it and go, that just looks like a lot of admin stuff to do. But when you put it to a case study with somebody talking about it and going, actually, if I hadn't have done X, this deal might not have gone through. Or actually, when I was trying to win over this client, having this information here, and that's why the process is important, or this is why we do what we do, or the product knowledge is important. That's what people resonate with. And it draws people in. Uh, we humanize it. We make it come alive. What you're talking about here is in some ways storytelling we know that studies of um pe people who are living in uh, small groups in uh, i don't know whether it's in siberia or in the uh, south africa but you know, hunter gatherers uh, spend lots of time storytelling it's how they communicate with information and usually by the fireside this is like a fireside chat yeah. evening's gone down oh i tried to do that and this happened now the voice of authenticity, we know that's important. We know I've been there and done it. The, the, the war stories are important. It mm. helps people uh, emulate it. How much do you have to be careful about people uh, being too authentic and saying, you know, it could have been a disaster? How much do you regulate the way they tell their story? Well, we want people to be honest. And it's funny you say that because actually on, on some of the, uh, especially with the customer comms, we actually looked at where things had gone wrong. Yeah. Um, and actually looked at things where they didn't follow the process and what was the impact of that. Yeah. And, and that was quite good. The, 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 the thing we're on that, we had to protect that person's idea. It's why I said to you, it's not about putting a, a, a picture or a slide of somebody or having them talk to camera. This is about using real authentic stories. Um, and what, what we took that 
to to another level was um, I'll give an example. We had uh, real phone calls. Then we had the permission for these guys to use these, and they weren't the particularly brilliant phone calls. They were good, but with our new standards, they weren't very good. So we right, it, keep it real. So what we have got fused to do was to transcribe the the call, and then re-record it. So everything was exactly authentic, even down to how long we kept that customer down to the second that we kept them on hold. Hmm. But all change was the customer name and our employee our employee's name so you couldn't associate and find out who it is so it kept that confidential but actually those calls had a massive impact because they could realize that on the face of it it sounds like, like a good call but once they've been through the training and then they reanalyze that call they go yeah that wasn't actually that good was it uh, they should have done this this and this wow but i do that on the call i'll make sure i don't do that again so that's that's how we, we be trying to humanise it as much as possible, keep it real. Pim, that's a great story. It really brings it to life. Mm. And you're exactly right. One of the great benefits of the human brain, why we have imagination, is our ability to say, what would I do in the future if I was in that position? And the information is only part of it. The humanisation, as you call it, contextualises it. Uh, absolutely, absolutely fantastic. I love the the way that's enabling people to start putting themselves in the future. Now that we've got Macaulay Trenchard has put through a question. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to hold that one to the end. If I may Macaulay, I like it. I think it's really good, but I, I don't think it's quite in the flow of where we are now. So please, anybody else got any questions, please put them forward to us and we will either send it to all attendees or to um, panelists only. We'll pick them up and love to have the questions. We'll, we'll put those to, uh, to pin at the end. You've given people the information or you've, you've sourced information, you've humanized it, you put this, this wrapper of store in authenticity around it, then you've got this third thing called refresh, what, or refresh, what, what does that mean? Well, that, that, that's uh, giving the people access to information really quickly, so that could just be by like an infographic, or really that summarizes maybe one, two, three videos, because we, we know that human beings work, and they, they'll do the training, but if in a month's time they want to come back and Go, oh, do you know what? I saw something on this and I just need to refresh myself on it. Will they watch those three videos again? Probably no. not. No, no, no. Nice to. Some people will. Come on, God. <laughs> but some people might. It just depends how you like to learn. But actually, because if we want to get the information, because we think we know it, we just need confirmation that we're doing it right. We, we have things like an infographic and those, those are brilliant. Um, you know, they're punchy colorful but they actually just bullet point or highlight the points that we want them to do um you know and that's that's what the refresh is about is they can go back into the learning and and just get a reminder and if they then need to go back and listen to some calls again or or watch somebody an sme talking about it or one of their colleagues brilliant they can do but the, the refresh bit is just an opportunity for them to yeah, we're actually back to what Katie raised earlier, this, this business of the point of need and relevant to make change. And I said there are there different um, points, according to Bob Mosher and Conrad Gottfried, and five different points of need. And the, the moment of need here, yeah, it's different. You don't need to learn it from scratch. Maybe you do want to watch the video, fair enough. But for a lot of people, it will be, now. Nah, just give me the clues and the hints that will trigger what I've learned. Yeah, and that might be an infographic. It might even be, just be a checklist. Bang, you're there. Refresh. All, yeah. right. That's all right. All right. Now, look. Um, I'd like to, actually, this, this kind of is Macaulay Trenchard's question. Macaulay says, you mentioned time slash cost competency on the sales program. Um, uh, how are you measuring success? Well, but perhaps this is the point where we should look at what the benefits and key results are. So, Pin, um, what were the benefits and oops, key results of this from your point of view? You said that when we talked about this earlier, you said there were two key benefits. There was engagement. Yeah. And yeah. SME engagement. Now that's, yeah. The SME engagement's a bit weird. Let's talk about the engagement piece to begin with. Well, the engagement in learning. I mean, the, one of the, the key impacts that we were trying to measure um, was just the initial engagement. How, how many people are going to do this training? I know it sounds really sort of a basic uh, measurement, but if we think about where we are as a business and, and the levels of engagement, which aren't at the top at the moment, you know, we are going through this, this journey of people logging into the system and doing training. Um, for the customer comms, it was the, the highest engagement we had. We had to like, in the first week, I mean, 60% of people had logged in and started looking at the content and engaging with it. 
in terms of liking it, sharing it, etc. So that was really good for us. Um, in answer to Macaulay's question, in terms of how we measure the overall impact, um, there's a couple of things we're doing. Is we, I mentioned rework. Uh, one of our, our key ROIs on this is looking at how much rework are we doing uh, on that, and that's driven by um, our HRBPs. Uh, and they are so driven by your HRBPs. Right. Sorry, your HR. Right. Sorry, I thought it was that. Right. Your eight. Yes. Okay. Your. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that, that's driven by that. So they're measuring that in terms of, because there's a, a key analysis in there. If, if we, uh, again, I won't give you the numbers, but it runs into the millions that if we can reduce the amount of rework and by people taking ownership and being more accurate in speed, um, then we can save ourselves a lot of money from just people having to do the same stuff over and over again and taking more ownership of it. Is it does pass on to someone else, um, et cetera. So we're, we're measuring that. But and also our NPS score, um, and and though we have to acknowledge when, that, when you say NPS, that's net promoter score. Yeah, absolutely. And again, we want to see how that impacts uh, on that, and and early indication that it's moving in the right direction, which is cool. Um, but that will be our measures of success. And I know that there will be a number of factors that will that will impact both of those measures, but will attribute training, etc., uh, as a contributor to that. Okay, so you've got the, one of the so you you, you are measuring uh, the impact and and the impact you're measuring is against a range of, KP, of, of key performance indicators yeah. some determined by VPs in the organization some which are just standard for the organization like yeah. get it right first time uh, uh, and and uh, you know is learning helping uh, s address that hmm. okay that second one SME engagement yeah, you talked about a, it earlier go on you kind of said that what, what are the benefits what's come out of this this was the most unexpected benefit that uh, that came out of both of these sort of programs. And that is, when, when we first started this, this uh, program so, and trying to get SMEs involved in sort of adding their knowledge, sharing what they know, their, their case studies, their war stories, but also getting in front of cameras, there was a real reluctance to do it. Um, and I think from a benefit for, for us now is that those SMEs and beyond, other people have seen this process, see how easy it is, and they want to get involved. And to me, that's absolutely crucial. They are the key to making this sort of happen because without their expert knowledge and, and input, we, we, we can't produce programs. So the fact that these guys, I was quite surprised um, that, that, that we had actual volunteers rather than having to kind of, I dare I say strong arm people into helping us out on the first round. Uh, this time, we're pushing people away. So that's pretty good, it's pretty cool. What? I appreciate that you've removed some of the fear hmm. about being in front of a camera, but it sounds like they're actually seeing it as a positive thing. Absolutely. So why, why do they like it? Um, they like it because you know, they're, they're passionate about what they do. Let's, let's you know, be honest. And, and, and even if we're not passionate about some, some of the things that they get involved in, you know, he's passionate about compliance, but these guys are. And they <laughs> see that this is, a, <laughs> this is a vehicle for them to get their message across. You know, yes, they yeah. send out emails and, you know, we do uh, internal comms on this stuff. How many people read a really long email with stuff? But actually, if I can capture that in a 30 second, 45 second video and put it in part of a program, my God, my audience is there and it's a captive audience and people want to do it. And, and, and they see it as, a, as, as another means to, to, to get them out there. And, and it's a fun experience. And, and I think the guys are fusing the camera crew and everybody, it, it, it's a fun experience. It's not daunting. <laughs> Actually, I have to say, I've been filmed by the guys at Fuse, and it, they do make it fun. It's not at all intimidating. Um, all right. Uh, I love that because, as you say, core to this is capturing the what I call the tacit knowledge in the organization, mm. surfacing it and sharing it effectively. And that's what that 12-step process enables you to do. But if you, ain't, if you haven't got the people, you ain't got the content. So Absolutely. clearly, the SME engagement, pretty crucial. Um, you've got a quote on this next slide. Who said this? Most engaging content ever produced. Who said that? Pin? Oh, God, do you know what? I, I, I actually said it. I, I've got to say, because, I, 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 do you know, I, I, Ryan, I'll kill you because you put it on there. Uh, I thought that was a private conversation, but thank you, Ryan. Uh, but it was it, it was the most engaging content ever produced, uh, which is a customer comp stuff. It was, it, was, it was brilliant. In fact, what we produced there, we the project was already kicked off with the branding, etc. internally. And I went to Fuse and said, look, I, I want to brand this and to make it something completely different to what 
cult has ever done. Um, and they come up with some amazing ideas and we filter them down. In fact, we, we had to do, and I said, we don't like doing rework. We actually had to rework all the branding that had already been done for it and bring it into the Fuse branding that, that we, we came up with. Um, and that was pretty cool. And, and we've used that globally now. And I think that going forward, that will be our um, customer comms uh, brand. So you most engage, you talked about the numbers earlier, that very yeah. impressive, that, num- that amount of engagement in the first week. Yeah. And I guess setting yourself a bar, a standard, which now you don't want to drop beneath. You want to keep yeah. that and keep getting better, keep getting higher engagement. Absolutely. Yeah, we do. Um, we want to keep going and push the boundaries as well and what we can achieve, you know. Um, so some of the stuff that we did for custom cons, like the interactive videos and that where you can kind of rewind and make certain choices and it's, it's a little bit funny, a little bit edgy but there's some serious messages in there you know it's pushing those things and, and how what can we do um you know and keeping that future relationship going uh, going strong then talk about the future relationship um you've got more things coming in the pipeline with fuse other things you're doing with your own people you're, you're training internally a lot of people might have yeah. these sorts of things on their on their agenda can you just talk us through very quickly what these four things are yeah, unconscious bias um you know I've, I've seen a lot of training on unconscious bias out there um, but I want something to be different um, because I think it's, it's an important subject. Uh, by its very nature, we're not aware of us <laughs> being biased, so we need to highlight that. Um, confidence gap. This is this is kind of to do more with our uh, network twenty five, which is our women's network. And one of the things that Colt is really, really passionate about is actually making sure that women in the workplace have the opportunities to grow and get promoted and, and, and take on to senior positions. And what we've identified is there is this confidence gap in, in our uh, population of females and, and how do we bridge that. Hmm. Pride network, you know, diversity inclusion, you know, again, if you, anyone goes past our building, you'll see it sprayed in the, in the pride colours. Uh, we're very proud to support that. Um, and we, we, we need to raise awareness, you know, no matter how much we do, we can always do more. Uh, so our diversity inclusion and making sure that we are 100%. 110% with that um, and the customer comms this is a natural progression in terms of the manager training because we we realize that you know it's great getting our guys um, who are really good at uh, dealing with customers but they need help so we want to train our managers to train to coach to give feedback and real supportive behavior um, and that's what that is and, and I, I'm looking forward to the, the journey stuff we can come up with a lot of people would say these are four things which are essentially soft skills soft content yeah. how on earth uh, do you make that happen with e-learning i guess you'd say don we've already proven that we can do it absolutely 100 percent. there you go Dom. <laughs> i didn't even have to answer that question <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, right, look, we, we, we're, we're, we're almost at the end. We've got like two minutes left. So, uh, do we have any questions for Pin from the audience? I'm going to move on to the next slide, uh, which is just when the next webinar is taking place, so that we've got that up. But uh, if you've got any questions, uh, we've probably got time for one question. You can you can throw it in before we have to wrap up. I'm going to move on to the to the final slide here, which is not to do with um, uh, the business of creating engaging content but it's um about the next webinar coming up on the 23rd september at 3 p.m bst that's of course going to be uh oh gosh that'll be 1600 hours uh, european time same time as uh as uh actually not the same time as this one but anyway there you are it's 3 p.m uh 1600 uh cet and 10 a.m eastern so please join us crawl walk run the First three steps to a more effective L&D strategy. Fuse talk a lot about L&D strategy. I think you can tell from the information provided in this webinar that they don't just churn stuff out. They do think about stuff. Uh, That's going to be a webinar well worth attending, 23rd of September. And you can see there, if you go to the chat area, that we've got uh, Ray Cairns, Global Director of Learning, and Dieter Doya, Learning Business Partner, both former learning leaders at large businesses giving you the tools to assess the maturity level of your learning functions core capabilities something very close to my heart how on earth do we get ourselves ready for the future it's changing fast and we have to respond to it by get just being better at L&D. i'm going to be attending that one certainly okay look it's been great to be with you today everybody looking forward i hope to seeing you again on the 23rd of september but for now i'd just like to say a big thank you to pin patel our learning experience consultant at Cold Technologies. 
talking us through how Cult created content with impact. Pin, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Looking forward to seeing you on the 23rd of September.